Great. Well, th thank you very much for the very kind invitation to come and uh, meet with you to discuss uh, this very important topic, uh, uh, not just to Ireland, but I think to every country now, entrepreneurship. I'm particularly honored to uh, uh, accept an invitation from the, uh, uh, from the enterprise ministry that I have understood had a lot to do with the great Irish growth miracle um, that occurred towards the end of the last century. Um, so it's a, it's a great honor for me to be here. I spent the decade of the 1980s at various colleges and universities getting my bachelor's, my master's, my doctorate. And what I recall looking back was that uh, uh, every professor that I had or knew basically had the same, they weren't doing the same thing, but they had the same job description. That is, they had the same expectations in terms of teaching, in terms of scholarly research. They didn't engage in what we would call uh, community engagement today. Uh, they would do service, which meant they would serve on university committees. Uh, there was really no interaction at all with society beyond the, the walls of the university. It seemed like we were at, maybe at, uh, uh, here at the University of Dublin or um, uh, uh, at Oxford or Cambridge or something like that, walled in, walled in university. Uh, but in fact, I was at the University of Wisconsin, you know, which is a, a land-grant university, a state university that had a, as a mandate to try to help the community, whether it's the city or the state. But back in the 1970s, there really wasn't much help that the university could deliver, either my university or any university in the United States, because what universities did research, teaching, didn't seem to really matter for what drove the economy. Um, what drove the economy back in that era uh, was what the Nobel Prize winner, Robert Solo, uh, an economist at MIT, uh, uh, won the, um, the, won the Nobel Prize for identifying what drove the economy was factories, machines, <coughs> in term of physical capital. The, the places, the cities or the, the, that had this physical capital, Detroit did well, Pittsburgh and Steel did great. If you had this physical capital, the companies too, that was the key strategy for success. Uh, <clears throat> yes, of course, the uh, uh, factories needed people, uh, labor and economics, but that labor was typically thrown into factories, into assembly lines, into mass production, so that what work meant was being reliable, showing up on time, being dependable, and obeying the instructions. It wasn't about anything that you could really learn at a university. In fact, universities, like the one famous one here in Dublin, have a great tradition of teaching people independence, teaching people to challenge authority. That's the last thing any, any uh, manager on a shop floor would want. So that there was a uh, I would say a divide, a wall between the university and, uh, and uh, uh, the rest of society. That's exactly what the great statesmen of, of in, in Germany, uh, uh, Humboldt, had envisioned when he won the independence of the university from the dictates of the state and from the church. Before Humboldt, uh, universities were really <coughs> arms of either the church or the state. And if anybody, if, if a professor tried to uh, expose an idea that went against the dictates of, say, the church or the state, they would run into trouble, as Copernicus did, right, when he suggested that the, uh, the sun, or that the, the sun, uh, or the, the, the earth revolves around the sun. The church didn't like that. And we all, we all know what happened to Copernicus. He almost died as a result. So Humboldt, uh, uh, was the great statesman in Berlin who freed the university so that, and gave us the university that we have today uh, uh, where it's all about the freedom of, of uh, uh, the freedom to pursue knowledge for its own sake, not because it's useful in the world. So that the university that I got to know in the 1970s was all about 
freedom of knowledge or to pursue knowledge for its own sake. And there didn't seem to be a lot relevant that was useful either for business or anything else in society. Uh, because really, business was not about what we call today knowledge or ideas. It was about taking raw materials, putting them into factories, and churning out manufactured goods like tires or steel or automobiles, both in, in Europe as well as in uh, North America. But this changed. This changed uh, as the world became, or, or from the perspective of, of the West, as the world became internationalized, now what we call uh, globalized. And uh, increasingly, uh, the, uh, the West started to realize its competitiveness depended not just on manufacturing commodities, but on ideas. Uh, a different scholar, Paul Romer, uh, is likely to win a Nobel Prize for coming up with the, the, the model that says what's important for growth isn't just physical capital, but it's also knowledge, ideas. Where do ideas come from? Where does knowledge come from? Nobody knows for sure, but we think it has a lot to do with um, uh, has a lot to do with research and development. Has a lot to do with education. Has a lot to do with human capital. Where do you get that knowledge? A lot of different places, but one place is universities. So that as the universe, as the as, as the the global economy started to emerge. Uh, in the 1980s, really, and then, and then accelerated after the fall of the Berlin Wall, the universities became uh, an important source. Society started to look, meaning society meaning what? Meaning cities, states, uh, even national governments started to look to the universities. They would invest in the universities in terms of funding for research, in terms of funding for students, but they needed a return on that funding. Uh, given the scarcity of funds, it didn't make sense to keep pouring money into universities just for knowledge for the sake of knowledge, but rather there, there grew this kind of either pressure or this expectation that said something's got to come from this knowledge uh, that uh, benefits people. Uh, and nobody, I think, really contested that, yes, the traditional role of the university is very important and is, is an underpinning of democracy and of, uh, of modern societies, but at the same time, the extra financing of universities uh, that was f driving research and, and a lot of the education, that was given on the expectation that there'd be a return to cities, states, and entire countries in terms of what they need, which is growth, growth of jobs, innovation, and ultimately competitiveness. So at first, uh, uh, I think that in the 1980s, um, uh, uh, there was a lot of disappointment because uh, uh, there didn't seem to be a lot coming out of the university. And at that point, scholars discovered there's a difference between investing in a factory or a building and investing in, in, in an idea. The difference is if you, know, if you have a table, you know what you have. If you have a factory, you know what you have. You know what you do. If you have an idea, you don't really know, will it work? And if it does work, you don't know, will anybody, will there be demand for it? Will anybody want it? And so there was something that, that we call the knowledge filter, really this barrier between, uh, between uh, the investments in research and then the innovation that would come out of it. I, I first heard about this on a, a visit, not unlike this one up in Stockholm about eight years ago, nine years ago, Stockholm was going through, the Sweden, Sweden was going through a period of economic stagnation, and they called a little meeting to ask what can be done to reignite the, the Swedish economy. I was kind of a disciple of this, this new growth model, the new endogenous growth model that said it's all about knowledge. So I marched into Stockholm and I told our host, the Minister of Economics, that I know what to do. What Stockholm, what Sweden needs to do is to invest in knowledge. It needs to invest in R&D. It needs to invest in university, invest in education, invest in patents. Even invest more broadly, if you think about knowledge, it's about ideas and creativity. Invest in culture. Put more money into theater and into uh, uh, museums and just help people become uh, knowledgeable and creative. And I, I'll never forget that day. Our host, the Minister of, of Economics, said, well, we're sure that the 
the professor must be right. He said, but nobody will ever believe him here in Sweden because by any measure indicated that the OECD does, whether it's R&D per capita, per GDP dollar, or patents per capita, um, uh, by any education measure, Sweden comes out number one or number two. Uh, and that was the first day that I heard the phrase, the Swedish paradox. What the paradox was, was that it's not enough just to invest in the knowledge of the ideas because people aren't sure which are the good ones or which aren't the good ones. They don't necessarily spill over for commercialization, for innovation. Rather, you need a mechanism to take it out. Now, the Swedes didn't, uh, uh, they didn't invent that that term, or they didn't invent that concept, they may have invented the term. Uh, even uh, uh, earlier, a senator in the United States Senate, uh, Senator Bai, had really observed the same thing at American universities. And he felt that even with all the investment from the federal government funding research, there wasn't enough coming out of the universities. So he and his colleague, uh, uh, Robert Dole got together, convinced Congress to pass the Bayh-Dole Act in 1980, which I won't get into the details, but it changed the property rights, intellectual property rights from, from uh, uh, innovations from federally funded research from the, you know, usually if you, if, you own, if you give the money, you own the intellectual property. That meant the federal agencies. It could have been the Environmental Protection Agency, the Pentagon, um, the um, National Science Foundation, that said anybody who wanted to commercialize a, a, a new product from that research would have to go through negotiations, red tape with the funding agency. The Bayh-Dole Act shifted the property rights to the university and suddenly they were in business. I mean, The universities could then decide what to do with the intellectual property that was accruing from all of this research. It seemed like a breakthrough. But over time, uh, we could see that there was an explosion of patents during the 1980s from the universities. But when people looked more carefully, what they'd see was a few universities, uh, MIT, Columbia University in New York, uh, the University of California system, but especially Berkeley, uh, uh, had a lot of patents. Most universities didn't have very many at all. Secondly, what they realized was that these patents were not generating a lot of revenue for the universities. That was one of the hopes that the universities had the intellectual, intellectual property, they could actually generate revenue which would help finance uh, part of the expense of research and education. But it wasn't working at most, most universities. Thirdly, there didn't seem to be a lot of startups from universities. Um, there's a national association of technology managers at, un at universities called the American University Technology Managers, Autumn. They have a national association. They collect all the data that the universities are engaged in. So we can see the patents, the licensing. We can see the spin-offs of the startups coming from the universities. And we don't see a lot from American universities. And uh, typically, there'll be something like 450 startups a year. Now, that might sound like a lot to you. you know, if the University of Dublin had 450 startups, that would be a lot. But we're not talking about the university. We're talking about a big country, the United States. There's 50 states. There's, I forget, 2,500 universities in America. Suddenly, that doesn't seem like very many. When we look at individual universities, MIT maybe is 23, 25. That seems like a lot. But MIT has this enormous science engineering um, uh, infrastructure. Stanford has six or seven. Uh, other univer universities, University of Illinois hardly has any. So it seemed that uh, there wasn't a lot coming out of the universities either uh, in terms of entrepreneurial activity that suggested for all of the hopes that the universities could fuel innovation either through technology transfer through licensing or through spawning spin-offs, uh, not a lot seemed to be happening. So I got to, uh, I, I, I did a project with a doctoral student where we realized, um, a lot of people realized, there was a problem with the data and the measurement. There was really a problem with people like, like me, the professors at universities. We were going to the universities asking what they did, when in fact, uh, 
the actual professors, scientists, engineers, other people at universities, they were had the capability of starting a company even without the going through the technology transfer office of the university. And this is because the technology transfer offices, they tend to be small with a handful of people, three, four, or five people. They're flooded every year. Every employee is required to fill out an intellectual disclosure form. I'm required to every, I think, I think that's true here, here in Ireland, it's true in all over Europe. And so every year I'm kind of proud of all my great ideas that could be inventions. I'm an economist. So every year I get back an email that says, thanks, we'll call you if we need you. And that's the end of it. And most of the, of the scientists and engineers at universities are people like me, that's what we get. So that these small offices, staffs, have to decide which projects look like they're the most promising to generate revenue for the university. They'll typically take something that's relatively standardized, perhaps an incremental innovation that could perhaps be licensed, and they'll follow that. Everybody else is free to do it, their ideas, what they want. And so what we started to realize that there's lots and lots of professors who are taking their ideas and they're commercializing them, and the university doesn't know about them. It's not really their business. So through the help of, of a foundation, the Kaufman Foundation in Kansas City, we secured the records of uh, scientists at the National Institutes of Health the top scientists who get grants. And we were able to, to through a, a survey and interviews, ask the scientists, have you started a business? These are very prominent, successful, the high flyers of science, PhDs from Oxford, postdocs at MIT, uh, residencies at, um, at Max Planck, and so on. And uh, what we found was that one out of four of the scientists we taught, we, we spoke with or interviewed or surveyed had actually started a business, which is a pretty high rate of, of entrepreneurship, really way beyond what, it, what anybody was else was picking up. Because we weren't asking the universities what they were doing, we were asking the scientists uh, what they were doing. And, um, uh, and, and so what we think, this has revealed that there's a lot more coming out of the universities than people had, at the American universities, than people had uh, previously known or expected. And we think this is important because this kind of entrepreneurship from scientists, from the university, that serves as the conduit or the mechanism that takes this knowledge that's really expensive, comes from as the result of research uh, in laboratories, uh, goes through all kinds of uh, uh, different vetting procedures, and actually ends up out in the market as a, uh, as a potentially new product or, or innovation. And it suggests to us that there's a lot more, uh, it suggests a couple things. First of all, that the role of the university has changed considerably from what I recall back in the 1970s, when I think there was really this separation between society and the universities. The universities were, I wouldn't want to say they were extraneous to, the, to society, they were fundamental for social values, for democracy, political values, but they were not a factor and in input into, into production, into economic growth. And I think the view was actually universities were, uh, a, were a burden, they were a luxury. Either going to one uh, was uh, kind of a luxury that didn't have a lot to do with uh, 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 a, 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 a good future income, in financing, one also seemed to be come at the cost of economic growth. It was a substitute, it was a trade-off of economic growth. Well, I think that, that view is totally flipped now, so that universities are viewed as complementary to innovation and economic growth. But one of the reasons why it seems to be, had this positive impact in the United States, is that we can't really see the impact. And when we look for it in terms of patents, or in terms of licensed, um, intellectual property, it's not really compelling evidence. Where we see it is actually through people. It's people, and especially the scientists and engineers, who are very active at, if they've got a good idea, they get involved in help getting that idea out into society. Now, we don't really know in a census for a broad spectrum of scientists and engineers 
we just really know for the, the, the very high flyers uh, in a very narrow field. We've done some uh, work since then. But I, to me, the bigger takeaway from this is that the role of the university has clearly changed. Uh, it's clearly not, I, I would never want to say, oh, it's working optimally or it's working well. It certainly has changed. Um, one of the reasons why I think uh, we're seeing so much entrepreneurship and commercialization from the American universities has to do with uh, the governance structure. I know that in some parts, maybe many parts of Europe, there's a sense and a concern that the, um, that the challenge for the European universities is due to an underfunding of the universities. And I think that's always an issue. But what I see is the big difference between the European universities and the, the universities in North America is a governance that allows the, the, the professors freedom so that they can be professors. They can, and this comes as a surprise to many people, they can stay at their jobs, but they could also start firms at the same time. The assumption I think many people have is, oh, they'll, they either have to go on leave or sabbatical or they have to stop being professor. Um, some do for sure, uh, but many don't. And I think it's a system that is designed to maximize the spillover of knowledge from the research labs out into the society, get those products out there that's going to create jobs and innovation, and worries less about uh, potential conflicts of interest between the professor who now has uh, a business as well as uh, his, his duties at the, uh, at the university. So um, I will just close by saying, I think in my lifetime I've seen um, perhaps not a revolution of the universities, but certainly a change in, in the universities. And I notice it's spread uh, across the Atlantic, to the side of the Atlantic as well. And I, I can see that the universities now are in a, in, a, in a process of transition from being a classic Humboldt University where the focus is knowledge for its own sake to a university where it still has that element of knowledge for its own sake, but now there's a priority also of knowledge because it can contribute to society, especially contribute to innovation and growth. Thank you very much.